perhaps this sort of spirit might give some inspiration to um, address some of these problems. Um, and what I will be talking about are extremely special, I, am, you know, I can't emphasize that enough, extremely special kinds of singularities that occur um, in space. And we've known, you know, for almost 40 years that for particular special kinds of singularities, when they occur in string theory and M theory, physics is actually smooth. And classic examples are, um, go back to this, the Dixon et al. paper, from papers from the 80s, where they first discuss strings in space-times that have uh, what are called orbital singularities. I'll tell you what they are a bit later. Um, and uh, more generally, we'll talk about what are called conical singularities. And the reason that physics is smooth there is because these singular regions of space support light degrees of freedom. And that's what makes the physics smooth at these singularities. Um, so what we'll, what we'll see is that these singularities themselves correspond to interesting quantum field theories in various dimensions. So that gives another motivation for wanting to study them. Um, and in some sense, that's been the kind of overarching picture of understanding space-time singularities in string theory, that they, they correspond to um, interacting degrees of freedom, when only in the cases when they make sense. <clears throat> Now, all of the known examples um, are, are singularities that arise in the extra dimensions of space. And all of these examples have what's called special polynomy. So uh, just I'll just remind you what the holonomy is. So holonomy is a concept that arises in Einstein's uh, theory. So Einstein's theory of relativity is based on a space-time manifold M and has a field, which is the metric field, the metric tensor on M. And out of this metric tensor, you can uh, generate the covariant derivative, uh, sometimes called the levi Civita connection, or in GR books, the Christoffel symbols. And using this connection, you can consider the parallel transport of, say, for example, vector fields around a closed loop. And this is the classic example you can see. Um, if you look at tangent vectors to that yellow closed loop on a sphere, once you go around the circle, around that closed loop, the vector doesn't come back to itself, but it's rotated um, relative to itself. And so uh, in n plus one dimensions, that rotation will be an element of the orthogonal Lorentz group. So it'll be an element of O n comma one in general. And that, if you look at the set of all loops that start and end at a point on your curved space-time manifold and look at all of the transformations, that is that generates a group called the holonomy group. And in general, for a general metric, that will be the general orthogonal group. But so special holonomy groups are ones in which that the group generated by parallel transport around loops are strict subgroups of the orthogonal group. So here, um, so these groups have actually been classified for say locally irreducible spaces by but you can't see that actually the bottom, but by Berger and Simons. Is that possible to move a bit? Um, in the 50s and 60s. And uh, in this table, what I'm showing are so the first line is the generic. So now here I'm talking about models of space. I'm not looking at um, Renzi, we're talking about Riemannian. 
So a generic oriented N manifold will have homonomy group S O N. And these below that are all the strict subgroups in various dimensions that can occur. Now, um, in, um, in string theory, if we look, if, well, if we look at like the vacuum Einstein equations, the vacuum Einstein equations just tell you that the Ricci tensor of your metric and your manifold is zero. So here we're not including matter or any other <coughs> background fields. So we're interested in vacuum solutions of classical string theory that have zero Ricci tensor. These are called Ricci flat manifolds. Um, that just means that the Ricci tensor is zero. And um, those occur in even dimensions where the homonomy group would be SUK or SPK, or in seven dimensions and eight dimensions where the homonomy group is the group G2 or spin seven. So yes here means that they are, all, of, all such metrics are Ricci flat and solve the Einstein equations. Um, you can't see it at the bottom, but if you're interested in a kind of what's known about this question, um, for non-supersymmetric cases, um, you can have a look at this paper I wrote a few years ago. All of these other cases, the special homonomy groups that are Ricci flat, not only do they solve Einstein's equations, but they actually preserve supersymmetry. So, and those are all the known uh, examples for compact manifolds. So, in M theory, since we have uh, 10 spatial dimensions, which is seven plus three plus one, we've got seven dimensions to explore and a kind of obscure fact is that there is this one holonomy group in dimension seven that's a special holonomy group. And that holonomy group is the, the Lie group G2, which is um, a maximal rank two compact subgroup of SO7, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, and we can also consider um, extra dimensions um, that have dimensions less than seven. And so the other cases are SU2 holonomy in four dimensions and SU3 in six dimensions. So our model space-time, our 11 dimensions look like product of this um, special holonomy space X times flat Minkowski space. So respectively, these will give rise to six plus one dimensional, four plus one dimensional, and three plus one dimensional models. And that's, those are the kind of things we'll be talking about. Uh, if for some reason you wanted to consider two plus one dimensions, could you compactify string theory on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I was going to talk about that, but I don't think I have time. But like, consider you can consider yeah, type two theories and heterotic theories and these seven manifolds and explore two plus one dimensional theories. Um, that is actually a subject which has not been explored that much. Okay. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this. So-called exceptional Lie group G two. So as I said, it's a it's a compact rank two Lie group. Its dimension is fourteen. Um, historically, it was the, the Lie algebra of G two was discovered by Killing when he was trying to classify uh, simple and semi-simple Lie algebras. In fact, he was trying to prove that the only such algebras were the unitary ones and the orthogonal ones and the symplectic ones. But he actually discovered all the exceptional ones as well. I'm not sure if he was annoyed by that or not. Um, there were some, Cartan sort of cleaned all of this up 
few years later. Um, 1900 is where the first public account of the Lee Group G2 appears in a talk by Engel, although he was talking about the complex form of the group, whereas all of the groups we were talking about are actually real. So subgroups of the real orthogonal group. Um, and first account of the real Lee group was actually by a little known, lesser known uh, mathematician who was Engel's PhD student, Reichel. And that appeared in 1907 in his thesis. Um, we will define it um, as in a simple way. So in special relativity, you can define the Lorentz group as the subgroup of, say, if you're in four dimensions, for example, you can, it'll be the subgroup of GL4, the four by four convertible matrices, which preserve the Minkowski metric. That will give you the definition of Lorentz transformation. Similarly, G2 is, is going to be defined as the subgroup of GL7, now we're in seven dimensions, preserving some constant field. And that constant field is a three index anti-symmetric tensor or a three form that I'll call phi zero. And in some coordinate system, this is phi zero. Most of its components, so three form in seven dimensions has 35 independent components in general. So 28 of the components of phi zero are zero. And these are the only non-zero ones. There's seven non-zero <coughs> components. So what this means is that the component one, two, five is equal to one. That's, it. That's the notation. So that's the definition. Um, an equivalent definition is that those components are actually equivalent to the structure constants of the octonion algebra. Um, so G2 is actually the symmetry group of the octonions. But we're not, I mean, that's just, I'm just mentioning that because uh, it's sort of interesting. We're not going to use it. So what it means is that if you had a manifold that had G2 holonomy, it would admit a three form, which locally in every tangent space is um, equivalent by some linear transformation to this phi zero. This three form will be locally constant, which means that under the covariant derivative given by your G2 holonomy metric, it will be covariantly constant. So some of you might have studied, you know, Kähler manifolds and Rabiao manifolds. So Kähler manifold has a Kähler form, which is covariantly constant. Then a Rabiao manifold has a holomorphic N form, which is covariantly constant. This is the analog of that. Just, this is your uh, open point. In the case of uh, Kähler manifold, you have the possibility of having a, a second one, which automatically gives a third one, and then you have a hyper Kähler, no? when you have more than... Yeah. So there is something similar here that you can talk about hyper G2 or something like this, or well, it's only one. It's only this. Ah, this, this is, uh, this is the, these groups and their, so, so for example, um, for the cases that are Ricci flat, the, there's a theorem called the splitting theorem for Ricci flat manifolds that tells you that uh, a compact special holonomy, Ricci, well, a compact Ricci flat manifold has to be isometric to a product of um, locally to a product of uh, simply connected compact Ricci flat spaces and flat tori or flat spaces. Um, so it's the irreducible pieces are actually simply connected, and if they are simply connected, or the universal covers are simply connected, then the holonomy group is the full group. You can't have anything less than what's on this table. 
So this is kind of everything. Um, in physics, G2 appeared quite a bit later, some 50 years later. And uh, I think the first appearance was due to Rakar, who was considering kind of uh, electron shell models and using symmetry groups for that. Um, Massimo, some time ago, pointed out um, that Alberto um, was also one of the first people to consider G2 as a possible flavor symmetry group of hadron physics. Um, and it wasn't until the kind of 90s that it appeared um, as a holonomy group in models of extra dimensions. Although it did appear in the kind of 80s in the kind of blue divine supergravity literature, but not as the holonomy group of the, of the actual metric. So the electron shell story, did it survive in any way? I don't know. <laughs> I know that Rakar went on to do, I mean, quite a lot of foundational work within just group theory that led to you know, people that then eventually use that for like possible physics model building and stuff, but I don't know about that. Isn't the institute named after him and the university? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one yeah. of the things that you know, they, when he said that the official language of physics is broken English, the students replied, for you it's broken Hebrew, because he had a terrible Italian accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's Giovanni, right? Giovanni Rakka, yeah. 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 Alright, so since um, we only have these possibilities to consider SU2 holonomy, SU3 holonomy, and G2, that's how I'm going to organize the rest of the talk, just into these three cases. That will give rise to, in M theory, 7D theories, 5D theories, and 4D theories, respectively. Um, I'll sketch some results from some you know, relatively recent papers. With, these are some of my collaborators um, from recent years. I'll mention Marwan Najjar, who's a, who was a uh, Palestinian, he, he was my PhD student, he's a Palestinian postdoc, uh, sorry, from Palestine. He's a postdoc now um, in Beijing with Tian, who was uh, a postdoc at uh, ICTP um, and is now back in China. Um, and then there was some work with Del Zotto and the Penn group, Max and Ethan are postdocs. Okay, so. Um, in fact, all of the, when I was talking about special singularities, um, all of the special singularities I'll talk about have something in common, which is that they are what are called um, conical. And conical is a uh, property of the metric, um, which you can understand just by thinking about this Euclidean space in spherical polar coordinates, when you write the radius and the polar angles, you rewrite Euclidean space as a cone over round, the round sphere of one dimension lower, the round unit sphere, in fact. So it's only when this is a sphere of unit radius that this metric is smooth and, gives, and is the Euclidean metric. If you change this G to any other metric on any other space, you have a singular space where the cross section of this cone, which in general we'll call sigma, collapses to a point at the origin. So it's only when it's a sphere that it collapses smoothly. And this metric cone here is Ricci flat, so it has Ricci, zero Ricci tensor if uh, the metric on this cross section is a positive Einstein metric with uh, appropriate uh, lambda.
And as I say, you have a conical singularity because this thing, uh, the cross section sigma will collapse. So since, since this is a positive Einstein manifold with Euclidean signature, um, it's actually a compact, it's also a compact manifold, like the sphere. So these conical singularities correspond to um, collapses of, they correspond to collapsing um, compact submanifolds in your ambient space. So let's start with the four dimensional singularities. So these are the easiest ones to describe. So they're all, um, all the conical singularities in four dimensions that correspond to SU2 holonomy metrics or singularities of SU2 holonomy metrics are of locally of this form. They're just, in the previous example, I was talking about Euclidean space. You can, if you take Euclidean space and replace the sphere by a finite quotient of the sphere. So the sphere has, you know, it's in dimension d minus one, it has an SOD symmetry. You can take any finite subgroup of SOD and quotient the sphere by it. Then you end up with a space which will be in four dimensions, a quotient of R4, which will have a singularity at the origin. So, whereas before, whereas in Euclidean space, the cone is actually smooth, um, in by, if this cross section is a quotient of a, some sphere, in general you have a, a, a singular point at the origin where the fields are not defined properly. And uh, for SU2 holonomy, this group gamma, we know them all completely. There has to be a finite subgroup of SU2. Um, and the finite subgroups of SU2 have been known for a long time. They have um, this famous ADE classification. So they actually correspond to the algebras. Um, how, do, how do you see this? Well, if you think about SO3 instead of SU2, I'm thinking of uh, SO3 as. quotient of SU2, then finite subgroup of SO3, um, if you think about it, if you have any finite order element of SO3, it will fix, for example, a line in three dimensions. So these are kind of finite groups of rigid motions of rigid bodies. So uh, uh, those were classified a long time ago. Um, they correspond to, for example, symmetries of polygons and n-gons um, in three dimensions, and that's why they have these names. Um, so there are three exceptional cases corresponding to the tetrahedral group, octahedral group, and the icosahedral group. These are symmetries of such uh, polygons, and then you have these two infinite series, which um, are the dihedral and cyclic groups. So if you lift those groups from SO3 to SU2, this is what you end up with. That's why these things are called binary groups. Okay. And there's a beautiful story about these singularities. We can sort of say everything. We can really understand the physics in M theory. Uh, better than any other sort of examples. And the physics of that, of M theory on such a singular space corresponds to a particular seven dimensional gauge theory, which is uh, super Yang Mills theory in seven dimensions with a gauge group of ADE type. And so this is a Yang Mills theory that has uh, fermions in the adjoint representation 
So it has gluons and uh, so-called gluinos. And what these things turn out to be are M2 brains of M theory, so extended two-dimensional objects that have, are wrapping various spheres that appear when you hit this singularity. And it turns out that, for example, the second homology group of this X4 ADE space, spaces, are actually equal to the, um, the root lattices. So the second homology group is a lattice. And um, this, the set, so the second homology group is the set of um, homologically non trivial closed two dimensional surfaces. And this is actually isomorphic to the root lattice of the ADE Lie algebra. And that tells you that the quantum numbers of these M2 brains are exactly the adjoint representation of the group. What is the amount of supersymmetry? At 16 supercharges. Is maximally supersymmetric. So, but when if these singularities, if can they be resolved and they are resolved to the yeah, so, some uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll describe that uh, momentarily. So, what I meant by this X four ADE is some is a space that I denote with this tilde. Which is a smooth four manifold, which has the same boundary as R4 mod gamma. And um, this has a complete metric of SU2 holonomy. And these spaces were classified in the um, sort of 80s, starting with the work of Gibbons and Hawking, and then was completed by Peter Kronheimer. Sorry, just one simple question. So, what's the difference between this R4 over gamma, this cone, and an orbifold? Can I describe it in one example? Um, yeah, I'll describe it in one example here. So, this, this, this sort of explains it here. Um, to show how this singularity arises, you can, for the case of the simplest case of um, uh, the SU2 gauge, Theory. So this would correspond to R4 mod Z2, where this is just generated by minus the identity acting on R4. Um, the smooth space can be written, the metric on it can be written explicitly here, and was, was written by Gibbons and Hawking in the 80s in the context of uh, Euclidean quantum gravity. So how, how do you describe it? Well, you have coordinates x, which are points on R3, and then you have a coordinate t, which is a coordinate on a circle. And the whole thing is determined by a harmonic function, v, which depends on some parameters. And uh, a is a, is, you can think of it as a gauge field on this three-dimensional space. So, you can show that this space is a complete, is a metric on a complete smooth manifold, and, it, and the holonomy group of that metric there is the group SU2. But, oh, no, I'm not going to go through that here. And what I've done is written it for the case of two, um, where, where V is you know, the sum of two Coulomb potentials centered at plus and minus. A, so A is just an arbitrary parameter. And I apologize for my drawing here, but so this, you should think of this as R3 and these curly lines as the circle coordinate. And what's happening, if you look at this function, um, so the inverse of this function, um, the circles are diverging as you go out from x, so as you go towards infinity. But when you hit the two poles, the circle collapses. So if you take a straight line in R3 between the two poles, or any line, 
you generate a sphere. And even though this looks sort of singular when you project it to two dimensions, it's actually smooth, this space, completely smooth. So this space has a two sphere in the middle of it, and then it goes off to infinity and actually becomes flat at infinity up, up to this identification. Okay. Um, so when you take this parameter a to zero, you get a conical singularity. And that sphere collapses to a point. And in this example, what appears there is an SU2 massless SU2 gauge boson. And in that case, you know, just have the whole root lattice is generated by this sphere. So it's just a one dimensional lattice, which is the root lattice of SU2. More generally, for these other examples, you get a collection of spheres uh, in the space that collapse to a point in the limit. And these spheres um, intersect according to the sort of Dinkin diagram of the ADE groups. Does that answer your question, Matt? It's, it's, so, would you say that the in the limit is going to zero? You have an orbifold singularity. Yes. In this case? Yeah. The, in the in this example, in this example, you can, you know, for example, explicitly show that this metric is the Euclidean metric up to this identification in the limit. It's is the flat metric. So, uh, are there more general conical singularities that singularities that are not orbifold? Not, um, not hypercalar um, SU two holonomy singularities that we know that give rise to complete metrics. Um, these are the, this is the only known kind of singular um, singularity. I can't rule out other possibilities, but. And here I'm not talking about singularities where, like, part of the space where you change dimensions, the fixed dimension of the space. These are the only known ones. You can have uh, when the depth state angle is not irrational, is not two pi over integer, for example, because it will be a conical singularity that's not over. When you have probably was saying it probably doesn't have super. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so those, yeah. Those, Probably give pathological type of behavior. Those. Um, just to mention in string theory, for example, in type 2b string theory, if you look at the same backgrounds, these same singularities give rise to these um, so called maximally supersymmetric six dimensional conformal field theories, which also have an ADE classification that are much more mysterious. Not gauge theories, there's some sort of mysterious interacting conformal field theories, and people take those conformal field theories and then sort of compactify them in various manifolds with various boundary conditions and so on to construct um, lower dimensional conformal field theories. So like all these class S theories and so on. All right, so so for the d equals four case, or corresponding to uh, six plus one dimensional, five plus one dimensional, you have these hypercalar ADE singularities that I just mentioned. As soon as you go to um, lower space-time dimension, or up to SU3 holonomy in six dimensions, and you look at these uh, conical singularities, things become much richer in some sense, but also much more difficult to understand. So, um, there's, the, the, there's some sort of law about these that goes back to sort of Cyberg and uh, Morrison and in the Trilligator in the 90s that the M theory, although they didn't really talk about what space time looked like, to be honest, very few people from me, 
talk about what the actual space time looks like. But um, that's an aside. Um, the law is that the M theory physics near these singularities um, is a five dimensional interacting conformal field theory, typically. Sometimes it can be a free theory of free fields, but mostly it's uh, an interacting theory. And these are sort of intrinsically strongly coupled because you're in five dimensions. Why is that? Well, if you think about um, uh, gauge fields with some gauge coupling G in five dimensions, then the dimension of the gauge coupling, one over G squared, has the dimensions of length or inverse mass. So that means that the coupling diverges in the UV. So these are actually U UV fixed points. So, for example, ordinary Yang Mills theory, some people in five dimensions, some people have argued you know, doing calculations in perturbation theory that maybe ordinary Yang Mills theory has a conformal fixed point um, uh, in the ultraviolet. But the, in the case we're in this framework we're considering, we're talking about supersymmetric theories and supersymmetric theories that arise from decoupling bulk degrees of freedom. Um, in M theory, from from uh, a system that arises at r equals zero, and in many cases you can study these things sort of more explicitly. <clears throat> right. So one way to do that is by considering cases in which this cone can be desingularized to a smooth manifold in much the same way I was considering in these lower dimensional examples. And for this, what one is talking about is um, an asymptotically conical SU3 holonomy metric, or sometimes also called an asymptotically conical Calabial metric. Um, what, what happens is that you, re you remove a neighborhood of the conical singularity and you replace it by a collection of compact and non-compact four-dimensional manifolds. In, this case, in these cases over here, we were replacing the singularity by a collection of two-dimensional spheres. In this richer, higher-dimensional setup, we replace it by um, four-dimensional manifolds. That makes things much more complicated. Um, this like a project with space, like can blow up or something like that? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's the same kind of framework. Coming I mean, each. The simplest, some simple examples are like that. Yeah. Um. Um. Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. You can. You can think of it as a um, as a blow up of the of the of the point here, yeah. um, and those things are the except, called exceptional divisors. That's right. So I'm thinking more in terms of the real space time geometry. I wasn't really using the language of algebraic geometry, but one, if you have such a smooth solution of Einstein's equations, then Space-time is smooth, and you can just do field theory analysis. And that will give rise to a 5D weakly coupled field theory. And these, these four-dimensional compact sub-manifolds, they will actually support Palooza-Klein gauge fields in five dimensions. Um, and they'll be weakly coupled. And obviously, if you then collapse these, these four manifolds down to zero size and go back to the singular limit, the, then the gauge coupling diverges formally. So you can actually understand this procedure quite precisely um, with explicit uh, examples, but I don't want to go into those details. Um, and one thing I do want to emphasize is that in these theories, 
at the singular point, we formally get both electric and magnetic degrees of freedom becoming light. Maybe in the, uh, in, the uh, in your question, Gaston, you were saying, can I think of it as a projective space as such? Should be a good kind of example. So um, th these these um, Calabial spaces are actually complex. And if, for example, one of these four manifolds is complex projective space of two dimensions, so uh, so that's uh, goes by the name of CP two. So that's the CP two is the space of three complex numbers minus the origin divided by common scaling where lambda is any non-zero complex number. So that's a real four-dimensional manifold which you can think of as a two complex dimensional manifold. And you can get singularities if you have a, a copy of this projective space inside your six-dimensional Calabial, and if it collapses to a point, you'll get one of these types of singularities. Now, this, this space um, contains uh, incontractable spheres inside it. So the same M2 brains that were collapsing to zero mass um, in the previous examples also collapse to zero mass here. And those guys are, the, they are electrically charged under these Billion gauge fields. But the magnetic jewels of these guys, which are uh, M5 brains, which wrap these four manifolds, are magnetic strings in five dimensions, and they also become light at the same time. In fact, these states are, uh, are BPS states. So this statement that they become light simultaneously is on a reasonably firm footing. Although, how to describe the physics at these conformal fixed points uh, is very difficult. Okay, now there are actually some relatively recent classification results on these types of spaces, but they're not particularly practicable. Um, instead, one can uh, look at explicit models um, which are completely analogous to the um, quotients of flat space, one can consider quotients of flat space in six dimensions. Um, and all, so now we're considering R6 mod gamma, where gamma is now a subgroup of the holonomy group SU3. These are all classified. They all admit these smooth desingularizations. And so they all admit complete vacuum space-time metrics with the right boundary conditions. Um, so one can try to study them. Just to give you an idea, I mean, you don't need to go through this, you can list all the groups. These groups are actually very rich in their structure um, um, and have many elegant properties. So one simple, I'll just give you a simple, one of the simplest kind of non-trivial examples, and these are so-called, these go by the name of TN, the theories in 5D are called TN theories. They're analogues of some four-dimensional theories that have the same name. So one thing you can do with these, with this type of analysis is actually completely work out all of the global symmetries that these would be CFTs have. So I'll give you an, a flavor of that. So these TM theories um, allegedly have an SUM cubed flavor symmetry group. These were originally constructed using uh, brain, brain models and so on, intersecting brains and so on. I won't go into the history of that. But in this, the, the, the M theory space time so these theories is given by a particular quotient of flat space, which is the product of two 
cyclic groups of order n. And this is explicitly how these groups are generated. So there's two order n generators, alpha and beta, and they act on the three um, complex coordinates like that. So you can see that both alpha and beta are contained inside uh, SU3, acting in the fundamental representation. And if you look at the three, there are three distinguished subgroups of this product of cyclic groups, which are generated by alpha itself, beta itself, and alpha times beta. So these are three different order n elements. And they're distinguished because they act, each of them acts trivially on one of the coordinates. So you see alpha acts only on Z1 and Z2 fixes Z3. So what that means is that alpha, for example, is not only a subgroup of SU3, but it's actually a subgroup of SU2. And we already know the physics of subgroups of SU2. They're given by seven-dimensional super yang mills theorems. So what it actually means is that this system looks like three copies of this seven-dimensional super yang mills theory with gauge group SUN that meet at the origin in the extra dimensions. And because each of these seven dimensional super yang mills theories is living on um, a copy of C times the five dimensional space time, the, from a 5D point of view, the gauge coupling is zero. So that's why you can, that's why the SUN becomes a flavor symmetry. So this is a proof that this system has SUN cubed flavor symmetry. And by studying more subtle properties of these spaces, you can actually work out all of the kind of higher form symmetries and so on, the, the generalized symmetries of these theories. So, we can think of these TN theories as a kind of junction of a trivalent junction of uh, 7D super yang mills theories. Um, and you can, you know, do, you can apply this kind of logic to all of the um, uh, examples of this kind. And you know, that was something we did in some of these papers. All right, so in the last just few minutes, I'll tell you the little that we know about the actual four-dimensional cases that we're interested in, which is when you've got G2 holonomy and four-dimensional um, theories. Sorry, just a question. So for the, for the exceptional type, what is the expected uh, global symmetry? Is it always like uh, the group of Q? Um, or generally the... Well, sorry, this is your um, no SU3 case. Are there some exceptional types? There are exceptional types, but... Uh, you get funny uh, global symmetry? Well, so, I mean, even... We get, so for example, we studied a particular class of non-abelian groups in which you take this, for example, you can take the TN theories and then you can mod out by a further permutation symmetry of order three. And then we found that, okay, I can't remember when, when n is multiple of three, I think, or the other case, um, that the, you actually get an E6 symmetry. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, that's something interesting to mention that sometimes these global symmetries can be you know, funny, I mean, they can be exceptional groups like E6, E7, um, and other exceptional groups. But, but you work on a general dictionary for this whole classification of SU3 subgroup. What is the corresponding global symmetry? I mean, we did it in detail for that infinite series. Uh -huh. um, uh, then Tian and. Uh, where is it? Tian and Ninan worked out some details for the other mm -hmm. um, groups. Okay. I don't know if they're able to determine it. The full uh, 
global symmetry people are not like that. I don't remember. Have you seen cases where there's symmetry enhancement? Well, that, well that, the case I was talking about is a case with symmetry enhancement. You don't, you actually just see three SU3 symmetries uh, from the geometry, but it actually becomes E6. I see, so that's beyond geometry. Yeah. Okay, so let's go just say a few words um, about the G2 case. So now we've got seven extra dimensions and we're talking about four dimensional theories. Um, you can actually get, there's some very interesting things one can say um, just about the occurrence of these ADE type singularities inside a G2 holonomy space. So near such a singularity, the space will look like this, where Q is some compact three-dimensional manifold. So what this looks like is a, from point of view of four dimensions, you, know, you get a theory which is a compactified version of seven-dimensional supi yang mills theory compactified on Q. And so for example, just to give you an idea, if Q was a sphere, the theory that you get below the kluser klein scale is actually pure supi yang mills theory in four dimensions. And this is a case that we studied a very long time ago that um, has, that you can understand kind of almost completely, in a sense. And uh, there's a sort of global parameter space of such things, which correspond to the um, gauge coupling and theta angle of your four-dimensional gauge theory. And there are kind of three semi-classical limits, one which is Kind of UV perturbative Supi Yang Mills theory, and then two other limits which are completely smooth um, backgrounds. And it turns out that these smooth backgrounds are have a mass gap, and um, you can explicitly see the, uh, the, the fact that these theories confine um, and have discrete theta vacua and so on. Um, so that's just bit of an aside, but uh, it's nice. These, these are nice um, models in which you can study aspects of um, confining vacua. <clears throat> um, but more in the spirit of um, the other parts of the talk, just to end, like one can try to ask the question, what is the physics of R7 mod gamma, where gamma is now a finite subgroup of G2? Well, here, um, since G2 is a subgroup of SO7, it's acting on R7, and SO7 preserves orientation, any finite order element of SO7 is also a finite order element of SO6, of some SO6. So it will always preserve at least one direction. And what that means is that if you have any finite order element in a finite subgroup of G2, it will be contained in some SU3 subgroup. So for any given element of the group, you can reduce to the previous case that we studied for SU3 holonomy. And what that means is that Whatever this system is, it corresponds to, um, it, it will be constructed as junctions of seven dimensional Supi Yang Mills theories and five dimensional conformal field theories, which all meet at the origin and to define a four dimensional system. So that sounds kind of complicated and rich, and it is actually complicated and rich. But at least uh, it gives you a picture of kind of generic orbital singularity inside a G2 holonomy space. Um, so one can study um, explicit classes of models in detail here. I'll just show you 
couple of pictures just to end. So what you have here is a picture of some models that came up in this in our recent paper. You actually have four um, seven-dimensional super Yang mill series. That's, those are these bulk regions A, B, C, and D. They intersect in various ways to give you TN-type theories in five dimensions. Those are the kind of straight lines. And then they all intersect um, at a point in the extra dimensions, which corresponds to a four-dimensional subspace um, where this four-dimensional system will live. Um, Second, this is another sort of picture, um, which is a bit more detailed. So, in some simple examples, you can start with this two copies of this TN theory. So, this trivalent junction means the TN theory, and these boxes mean SUN global symmetries, three SUN global symmetries that we had. Then there's some parameter in the geometry which controls the size of some four-dimensional manifold. If it's finite, then these TN theories kind of intersect and you can have a sort of local gauging of, a, of, of these SUN symmetries. And in the limit that you get this four-dimensional system, the TN theories degenerate into kind of four TN theories, um, which all which meet and intersect and have common gauge groups in some uh, intricate fashion um, that's described by some kind of graph or generalized quiver diagram. Um, so studying these G2 holonomy spaces allows you to construct four-dimensional field theories as sort of jun junctions of higher dimensional field theories. Um, and since that's what the theory is telling you um, are the like, you know, is a picture of this kind of light degrees of freedom near perhaps a generic singularity. Um, these theories may be representative of what might be like a generic hidden sector in string theory. Because you should really think now of a compact G2 manifold that has many of these different singularities, and near each one you'll get some complicated system like this that has gauge fields and 5D interacting CFTs and, and all of the sort of ingredients that came up here. And you know, I'll leave you with a question, you know, maybe the kinds of singularities like black hole singularities and cosmological singularities, the ones that we really like to understand, maybe this kind of spirit um, could be use, maybe you know, eventually we could understand those singularities in terms of some very special kinds of um, quantum field theories. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry if I went over that. Any more questions? Or... So, so these examples all preserve a lot of symmetry. Um, yeah, so well, the four, to one, four dimensional ones, yeah, they preserve minimal supersymmetry. Some but, so, and you mentioned maybe these are like generic hidden sectors and stuff, but if you were to break supersymmetry, might that not change things dramatically? It might. I mean, so of course, we have to consider supersymmetry breaking at some scale. Um, I think there's some literature on what happens to these 5D theories when you break supersymmetry, um, but not much. Um, it might be that, that they become you know, less interesting if you give maps to the Gluinos or whatever. You know, so, yeah, 
nice example is take weakly coupled super yang mills theory in five dimensions, and then that guy has a strong coupling singularity. Some you know, five, some of these five D systems are just weakly coupled gauge theories that uh, have this fixed point at high energies. It might be that uh, the evidence for fixed points of ordinary 5D Yang mills could be used uh, to argue that you still have a fixed point because if you pick up all the Gluinos, for example, and you're just left with pure. Since the theories themselves are very difficult, you know, they're not Lagrangian field theories in that limit. Some interacting CFT with operators and so on, but we don't really even know what those operators are. It's difficult to address that question. Okay, so that's an excellent question. Is there, okay, so, is there a limit in which the manifolds with proper G2 polynomy can also be understood as type 2A compatifications? Uh, I mean, weakly coupled or. Yeah, 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 there is. So, uh, um, so we know that M theory back divide on a circle, and the limit of the circle is very small. It's type 2A theory, and the size of the circle is the string. Some power or whatever. So uh, you you can have you, you can have compact G two spaces that are um, sort of collapse limit of that collapse to six dimensional spaces where the fiber generic fiber is a small circle, mm -hmm. um, and in the limit, what you get is a type two A what's called a type two A oriented fold compact. On a Calabiao, so the Calabiao with uh, oriented fold planes and G6 planes. So, when you say that these are generic confusion sectors, so I mean, so how do we know that there are no more complicated singularities? More complicated, yeah. Um, so, here, just we, to start with, restricted to this one possibility. Yeah, so uh, we don't know. Um, one, if you, if you, yeah, so the thing about conical Ritchie flat spaces, it's my man. So actually, I'm just trying to understand what is important in this construction. For instance, for the fact that gravity decouples in 50, that's very Ritchie flat. Yeah, so, so, so you want to decouple gravity. Right. Now, what that what that means is that uh, if you really want to decouple it, you have to have a complete space time, a complete metric with a complete space time um, that solves Einstein's equations. So it has to have some kind of asymptotic behavior away from the singularity. For Ritchie flat, um, this metric has the scaling symmetry when R goes to lambda times R. So it has this scaling symmetry. If you had, you know, so imagine there's only one direction that goes off to infinity out of your singularity, then the leading terms in the metric will be some power of R. Um, it's only when the power is two, <coughs> you have this additional scaling symmetry. So that's one reason to think that these are special, but uh, I mean, essentially nothing is known about other types of singular behavior, um, unfortunately. Any more questions? Okay, thank you for the next talk.